So we forgot to do an intro for this video. And so I'm gonna tell you kind of how it was before you get to watch it. Uh, we did a video with Kevion and his mentor Thatch. And Kevion's been telling me about Thatch forever. Uh, pretty much there's a lot of really cool aspects about Kevion that I'm always like complimenting him on. And he always says, oh no, it's because of Thatch. And I got to meet Thatch and it was awesome. He, I mean, dude, as you're gonna see, he is full of energy. Uh, it was so fun. And also, dude, there was a moment where he was talking about his dad and really uh, the reality of money, that money isn't anything other than a tool. And dude, it was emotional. I, I, I almost <laughs> didn't even know how to respond. It was like I was just mesmerized watching him. So it was incredible. There's so much wisdom and knowledge in this. I can't wait for you guys to watch it. Uh, check it out now and then leave comments. Let us know how it is. It was, uh, I mean, dude, it was, it was amazing just being in the moment. So I guess let's start this thing off. First question, how did you guys come together? How did you guys meet and, and what did that look like? So for me, um, I grew up, you know, skateboarding, causing trouble all over the place. I moved to Orange County from Ohio, originally from LA, but when I moved back, I had to go to Ohio. When I came back home, um, my mom had become a top sales rep at a motivational real estate company, right? And all of a sudden she's becoming friends with all these top producing uh, realtors. I wasn't paying that much attention to it. I was still causing a lot of havoc. And I just remember I was into DJing at the time and I would be DJing in my room and that would come in probably because my mom would say, would you go talk to my kid? He's in there sm <laughs> smoking weed all day long. Would you go talk to my son? And so he would open in the door. He'd open the door and he'd, okay, so you're cutting it up in here. And I'm like, Close. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know who he was. Yeah, and keep this guy out. <laughs> Dude, and he was cool, but still, I was, you know, I was trying to make a mixtape. Yeah. And um, one day, I remember I came home. I'm probably a, a junior in high school, and I opened up the garage. We lived in a little tiny apartment complex, and there's a brand new uh, CL Mercedes Benz, the coupe, when the body style changed. I've always loved beautiful cars. And I'm thinking, what the hell? My mom freaking wanted a lot. There's a hundred thousand dollar car in our garage. I get, get into the house and I'm like, mom, what the hell? She's like, oh, that's Thatch's. Yes. He, he, he wanted to be the first person in the country to have it. I'm like, who the hell's Thatch? My friend Thatch. And so he lives up in Seattle. He bought the car here at Fletcher Jones, but he kept it at our house before he shipped it up. I took that thing out that night. I was 17. <laughs> And so he started inspiring me before he even knew it. He didn't find out for a few years that I took that car out that night. I wonder why I had like a couple hundred miles before I got out of Seattle. <laughs> Fast forward um, three months later, I'm a junior in high school and um, I had a, a DJ session gone wrong and um, I get the news that I'm gonna have a baby, right? And, and, and <laughs> Um, it's the scariest thing in the world when you're 17 and you find out that you're about to be a father. Yeah. And there were two people that I called. Uh, one was Jonas, who was my best friend, and two was this dude, Thatch. And I didn't tell my mom yet, but I asked her, I said, hey, that guy, Thatch, uh, can you give me his phone number? <laughs> and I called him, I said, hey, dude, look, I met you a couple times, I'm about to have a kid. Um, what the hell do I do? How do I make money? That was the only thing I wanted to know. Yeah. And I knew he made money legally. So for you and when you meet him, was it, did you see something special in him or was it more like, all right, I don't know your mom's name. Corinne. Corinne. Was it more, all right, Corinne, I'll help you out with your kid. What did you see? Yeah. I mean, as I was spending time with Corinne at the house, uh, I can see Kev, you know, he had the, I, I would call it the natural salesperson in him. Yeah. A little bit on the slick side when he was younger. You yeah. know what I mean? Right? He can get in trouble, he can actually talk his way out, that kind of guy. Right? But people like that, though, actually, I think they got good sales skills if you hone them. Yeah. Right? And so Kev has that, and so it's more I spend time with him, the more I talk to him, I can see the guy is also, he's you know, creative, he's ambitious, right? he's hungry, he's a little bit slick salesperson, but the hunger was in him. Because yeah. you can just meet people, and you can just know someone's hungry, and you know, unfortunately, you can't teach hunger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's one of the things where, for me, with my kids, I don't like to give them anything for free. 
Yeah. Because I think if, I think you give and you make things easy for your kid, then you take out the hunger in their life. Yeah. So my kids, you know, if they want Yeezy or they want something good, they gotta work for it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like Russell Hudson, they have to get straight A's. They get straight A's, and then whatever they want, then we'll give it to them with a limit. You know, yeah. like they want to buy some, you know, a Supreme hoodie, for example. That's like two hundred dollars. You gotta get straight A's, right, for a whole tri uh, trimester. And then if you do that, they will give it to you. Got it. Now we can easily give it to them, but I want them to learn how to be hungry. Yeah. Right. Performance based. It's performance. Yeah. You see what so. I mean? And so, you know, he had that, and he just needed someone to actually like really, you know, hold him accountable to the kind of kind of kind of goal. You know what yeah. I mean? And car was one of the things for him. Got it. Right. Got so, it. So and so my car was the inspiration. You know and. And now Kev, you know, he just told me that day he's happy to keep my Rolls Royce at his garage for, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. for the weekend. Take care of that thing. And then at this point, so I, I guess currently right now, you've been a real estate developer and investor for 30 years. Yep. Uh, you're an author, yep. motivational speaker. Yep. Uh, at that point, were you just doing real estate or were you also on the speaking side? And did you have a book back then? No. No. So, um, you know, I still sell real estate today, okay. right? And I was still selling real estate when I met Kevin. Uh, I always been still selling real estate. That's, that's one of my primary business, right? And then um, I was flipping houses back then. I was wholesaling back then. I was building multi-unit and I was building an apartment building. I was doing all that when I, when I got to know Kevin more and more. Um, and then of course, coaching wasn't really something that was in my thing to-do list, but it was just something that I was just doing things and then people were like, man, you just, how do you do that? And yeah. I would just share what I did. Yeah. And next thing I knew, you know, I would coach Kev and when everybody knew I was coaching Kev and then all of a sudden I get somebody else, hey man, can you teach me what you taught Kevin? Yeah. And next thing I knew, I would help a few people here, people over there. And next thing you knew, I just ended up getting so many requests for it. But I really didn't want to take on a lot of climbing because I just like to just work. I like yeah. to work, I like to do my thing. Uh, and then uh, I had a few friends that came to me and wanted to collaborate, my friend Matthew. And then we would, I would do speaking engagement, you know what I mean, for a while. And then I liked it, but I didn't like it as much as me doing deals. Yeah. So I went back to doing deals. And then uh, about, three, four, about three years ago, where it came full circle now, where I spent pretty much the majority of my time doing my deals. Then I spent the other 20% of my time teaching people how to do deals now. Got it. Like that. Got it. And for you, was there a, a breakthrough moment that happened where it was like, all of a sudden, maybe that said something or something happened in your life where you're like, ah, this is it. Here we go. There's been a lot. I mean, every time we hang out is a breakthrough. Yeah, last April. <laughs> last April was a big breakthrough. Yeah. Tell me, tell, tell everybody, I talked to you about what that breakthrough was. Do you mind telling everybody? Um, so if it's the same one, because we talk about a lot of them, right? It's but the, 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 big, the big breakthrough uh, was Thatch was here and it was like, I've had such an amazing experience of becoming the, the real estate agent. I've always, the million dollar selling blah, 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 real estate agent. Like th that's the goal, that's the dream. Get to this income, build this thing around you. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm at this place, but I'm like, well, where's all the, where's all the my money at? Yeah. You know, where we have investments and we have savings, but it, you, you have to earn a lot I think, and, and not be a good investor. We don't have to, at least my path was, I had to earn a lot and, and not save enough to realize that if you don't have a clear savings plan, you're, it's going to disappear. Right. And everybody says that. It's like, yeah, co finance 101, right? But I had to experience it for myself where I was like, all right, I'm done, man. And what happened was that He's in a game of investing and flipping. Yeah. For me, everything I do, our brand, the homes I list and sell, they have a design, they have an aesthetic to it. I specifically look for modern and mid-century modern architecture. So this whole flip game wasn't really grabbing me because I'm not just inspired about money. Yeah. And so that says, well, Kev, what if you were to flip mid-century modern? What if you and Alana were to become the Eichler of 2020. Yeah. It was like, that was the game changer. That was April yeah. 2019. 10 days later, I went to a neighborhood where all of the homes are designed by A. Quincy Jones. A. Quincy Jones, it was the, the main architect. Yeah. You live in an Eichler. Yeah. My, it just gets my heart beating. I knocked on one door. She, this gal opens the door and she goes, Kevion? 
And I'm like, yes. Yeah. She, she goes, I follow you on Instagram. What are you doing here? I was like, I'm looking to invest in this neighborhood. I love the design. She goes, go to that house. Somebody just passed away there. Mm. It's totally original. We bought the house for 500. We sold it for 750. It got the cover of Atomic Ranch magazine. It was like the dopest experience. And now what he's been saying is, you don't need to stop being a real estate agent. But Kev, I'm telling you, you're missing out by not adding this. And I had to find the trigger that would help me catch the vibe to flip. And so that's what, that's how it shifted is now we invest into mid-century and modern architecture the same way we sell mid-century and modern architecture. Yeah, yeah. I love that. So that's actually a perfect segue. Why does it seem like a lot of people who sell homes only sell homes yeah. and have a problem transitioning into Don't the next started, stage? Man. Don't get started, but, but you would say that that's the masses, yes. right? Yes. So the masses have an opportunity to sell homes to then make money, right? Yes. Yes. That's their wealth builder. The the realtor, That's right. but they've got to put the money to work. Why don't they put it to work? Well, and, what? and so many times I've sold a home where I made this investor dude an insane amount of money. Yeah. And I just wasn't wearing that hat. Yeah. I was only wearing realtor hat. Yeah. Yeah. So what's 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 the challenge there? I tell you the challenge, man. You you, you speak in my topic right now. This Good. is how I talk about the biggest challenge is why real estate have a hard time being a realtor and an investor at the same time because the first thing is, is their identity. See, there's somebody as a real estate agent. If they're successful, they're already somebody. They are a luxury specialist in Southern California. Everybody, everybody know Kevion. But the moment if I go into investment, I lose my identity. Who am I? I'm nobody. I'm starting all over again. Nobody likes to start over because it's humbling. Yeah. They got to work their way back up the ladder. So. I don't want to stop this. This is me. I'm on Instagram. Everybody know me. I'm a real estate. I'm a top dog. Man, I love this. I get stroked. You know, I love it. It gives give me this whole energy, right? Because the ego kicks in. And that's the biggest reason why they don't do this. Because they can learn it. They already play in the same sandbox. Yeah. They just got to know how to basically figure out the number as an investor. Yeah. They don't want to give up this. The reason why it was hard for me, because I was a top agent in real estate in Seattle. And when I started transitioning more and more into real estate, I lost this. I was known for this area called Beacon Hill, like Kevin known for Southern Cal. And I was known for that neighborhood. And eventually I started losing listing to other agents. And I started seeing other agents' name go on up on Beacon Hill and it hurt my feeling bad. All right? And I, it, it was a point where I wanted to go back so I can actually say to myself, my ego, fuck that. I'm the motherfucking man in this neighborhood. You ain't taking this shit. But then I get 3% versus hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And that's the biggest reason why real estate agents do not want to do this because they're somebody over here. And if they start over here, they're nobody. That's the biggest reason, but there's more, more, many more reasons. But the biggest reason is identity. Like Tony Robbins speak about all the time. Yeah. You're somebody. Yeah. This is why I told Kevin, you don't have to drop the identity of basically you're the luxury agent. You can continue to be the luxury agent. Just actually have your son. Actually have KP, ask some of your team member, go out there and cold call all the Eichler fixer in the area and hand it over to Alana and let her deal with it. And you just keep running the luxury brand. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. But that right there is a simple conversation, but it's a hard thing for agents to wrap through their brain yeah. because, man, don't you know who I am? I'm the top kingpin in this area. I'm the top agent. Yeah. And they buy into that shit and they still don't make no damn money at the end of the year. Yeah, 100%, I think what's interesting is, we can take this beyond real estate and the importance yeah. of identity. Flipper and, and wholesaler, blah, 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 everybody. Everything, yeah. totally. I was, I was a, we talk about this all the time as a pro skateboarder. Yeah. yeah. Pro yes. skateboarder went yes. away, all of a sudden 100%. identity goes away and it was starting over. I, I, Athletes. 100%. Athletes, yeah. same way. 100%. Yeah. So you now, now having crossed over, uh, what could you say to the person who, uh, what are they missing out on by not going into the investment world? Number one. When you sell real estate only, or you wholesale only, or you flip only, the problem is you're trading your time for money. So you're on the treadmill, you're running, you're running, you're running, 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 and all of a sudden, man, I need a little break. You go on vacation, you're like, damn, it's been a week. I gotta get back on the treadmill because I ain't making no money. I gotta run, I gotta run, I gotta run again. The problem is if you're doing business as a wholesale or realtor, that you gotta trade time for money, you can never get off the treadmill because the moment you get off the treadmill, your income stops. That's, right. That's the biggest reason. 
on the world of investing when you got things that like real estate holding. You know this. Yep. Now you're trading money for time. That's right. Now you can go do anything you want to do, when you want to do, whoever you want to do with, and you got an asshole seller. You're like, thank you, but I'm good. I'm going to refer to somebody else. You can't do that when you work and trade for time for money. You got to take everybody to everybody. So the biggest thing that they're missing, not even talking about money, but you ain't get the freedom, the choice, and the option to say to a customer, I'm sorry, but I can't work with you. You know why? Because you're an asshole. Yeah. That would be tight to say. Yeah. Bam. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I, that's powerful. That's, that's real. It, 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 it's we know real. it. We've been, we, there's been a lot of clients we all deal with, but we know damn well we should have never took them, but you take them, you know why? Because you ain't got no other income. If you don't do it, you ain't gonna have no money to pay the car. So you gotta suck it up and you gotta eat, you know what I mean? You gotta deal with them. The greatest thing now is that I can send somebody come to me and, and, they, and they're asshole. I'm like, hey man, I appreciate your time, bro, but you know what? See ya. Yeah. And then the other greatest thing is when I get the freedom options, I get 100 grand a month coming every single month passive income right now. And I, the great thing is I'm in Southern California for two months living down here. I was going to say that. Talk about you saying that. W w what do you do every year? You take off the month of? I always take off December and I travel through Asia. Yeah. Or I travel through California. This year, since pandemic, I decided to come down here for it's like seven weeks. Yeah. But see, when I bought my first rental property you didn't just come down here. You know, if, we mean, we mean you, if me and you stay somewhere for a month somewhere, we're going to stay. We're going to go to Enterprise Rent-A-Car <laughs> and, you know, get a car for a month. He not only came down here, I hooked him up with a really dope house yeah. at the beach, but he shipped both of his dream cars. He had to come and stunt on all of SoCal, had to bring the Bentley, brand new Bentley down and the Don with your travels. That's freedom. What, what a choice, jerk. Bro. Yeah. Right? A jerk. That's freedom. Touch on that. What does money really give you at the end money of the day? Money at the end of the day, three words. Freedom, option, choice. Yeah. That's it. That's what money do. You got the freedom to go whenever you want to go. You got the option to do what you want to do. You got the choices to buy what you want to buy. You got choices to work with clients you want to work with clients. At the end of the day, money isn't anything other than freedom, option, and choice. And if people don't get that right there, then they're going to work for the rest of their life running on that treadmill. But when I bought my first rental in 1997, I told myself, me and Cammy, this rental is the first rental that's going to set ourselves up because I bought it in 1997. Yeah. And he said, this is the beginning for the setup, like a volleyball setup. Yeah. This is the setup where we buy this and we do this correctly. By the time I'm 50 years old, I don't have to work and I can live wherever I want to live, yeah. whenever I want to live, travel when I want to drive, drive when I want to drive. Yeah. And that was my first rental in 1997 and I still own that property today. I bought it for 105,000. It's free and clear. I bring in 3,000 a month and it's worth $750,000. That's freedom, option, and choice. How, how, how old were you? I was 27 when I bought the house. And how did you have that mindset at 27 to think that a rental property is what's setting yourselves up compared to what the average agent does, right? Yeah, the average or just the average person. We, we work and the car is the one thing that's going right. to get us. Right. If I get the car, you didn't think when I get the car, you said when I get this rental property, that's going to set us up. How, did, is, how did you have that mindset? I'll tell you what it is. And, and, and for the young folks, you heard that before, but I now got to live it. Who you hang out with is how your mindset will be actually formed. All the guys out there flipping, they hang out with people that flip hundreds and hundreds of homes a year. And at the end of the day, you know what they get? More flip when they're 50 years old. If you want to actually be hanging out with people who actually own investment property, you want to hang out with people that own investment property, not the guy who flip a lot of houses, because the guy who flip a lot of houses, only thing he's going to tell you is, bro, you didn't up your game. I'm flipping 100 homes a year. You only have 50, idiot. Yeah. And you know what that guy do? Run fast on the treadmill. Yeah. And at 50 years old, he can't stop running because now he got high overhead, he got big office, lots of bill, lots of staff, and he can't slow down because his life now is ran by all this ego. Yeah. So. Saul was my mentor, and he said to me when I came and I, look, dude, you're 27 years old. You're going to have kids later on down the road. Trust me when I tell you, you want to set yourself up so what? when your kids are like 12, 13, 14, 15, you want to be able to go to the baseball matches and the baseball game there yeah. anytime, and you want to travel, go with them. You want to set yourself up so you can do that. And then you want to set yourself up so that when you are traveling, you don't ever have to come back when you, want, when you have to. Yeah. You need passive income. Yeah. So to me, Saw has been someone who told me, tell me over and over and over, like I'm going to tell you over and over and over, right? I tell Alana, we need the passive income 
Otherwise, you cannot have option freedom choice. Right. The greatest thing I have right now is I'm 50 years old and I set myself up, I based it 1997, and today to be down here, living down here and do what I want to do, drive what I want to drive down here, man, it's, I look back and I go, damn, that setup actually worked perfectly. Yeah. But the key thing is I had to stay in my game and I had to stay focused and do it since 1997 until 2020. How many years is that now? That's 30 years. Yeah. 30 years, as I've been on this track, have not come off this track for 30 years. Yeah, yeah. It don't happen overnight either, I'm gonna say that. Okay, there was a lot of, there was a lot of wisdom in that. Yeah. Uh, one thing you said, which I think is so big, is like the quote, no one ever gets rich because of their first deal, nope. but they always get rich because of their first. Yep. They never get rich from their first, they always get rich because of their first. Two, if you're always flipping, that it's a job. It's, it's different job. than investing, right? The right? same as being a real estate agent. Yeah. That's right, that's right, that's right. I, I got a question for you. Has your view of money changed over the years when you first, because you guys have a similarity where you're both uh, high earners, right? You have this drive to make a lot of income, separate from the investing side. Uh, what was your view when you started getting, getting into it? I just want money. Was money this uh, certain kind of goal? Was it an object? What, what was it back then? For me personally, you know, it comes from the top of, of what I originally learned about money growing up. You know, my dad was a drug dealer. He got sentenced to 20 years. And so he would come home and he would throw a briefcase full of money and we would celebrate. So my dad literally looked at money like you have to get rid of it as fast as you can before it gets taken away. That was devastating <laughs> to my career. Uh, not devastating to my career, that was devastating to my ability and my relationship to money. I mean. By the time I was 23, I had made well over half a million bucks. I had nothing to show for it. Yeah. And so to me, money has always meant celebration and, and let's go have fun, yeah. which is the opposite for my wife, which is no, let's be smart. I'm like, be smart. Yeah. I try to party. Yeah. Um, and so it's changed as to now money is about legacy. Money is not about, celebration is a daily part of our life every day by, by being here. Life is a celebration. Living is a celebration. Money is legacy. Yeah. yeah. What about you? Yeah, you know, when I was coming up, you know, coming from Vietnam, we had nothing. Yeah. You know, we came over here, eight of us, one suitcase and a hundred bucks, right? And so when I was coming up, I grew up in an area in South Seattle where, you know, a lot of gangbangers and a lot of drug dealers and a lot of my friends were gangbanger and drug dealers. And so when I was a teenager, you know what I mean? Of course, you know, I see a lot of these guys have nice cars. So of course, making money to me is, you know, I can have nice stuff. So I would work three jobs. I worked parking cars, working at, you know, grocery store, bagging grocery, working at a body shop just to make money so I can actually have nice stuff. Yeah. But then when I got into real estate, right, I started making good money and, uh, and uh, I was still buying good stuff, buying nice cars and everything. But I will say, um, as I got older and wiser, and then I think my first year I went back to Vietnam, it was in, um, I would say, it was, I think it was 1996, 1997. And when I went back to Vietnam, man, I saw how my grandma lived, and I saw how my auntie lived, I saw how my cousin lived, right? You know how it is when you went to the Philippines, right? And I saw these, my, all my family live, man, like how they living? And I'm over here throwing away 20 grand, 30 grand, 40 grand, 50 grand, like, like just, just, just stupidly, you know what I mean? And then it changed my perspective about being more responsible with money. Yeah. And so then um, I started basically getting wiser. And of course, my wife has always been like the Ilana also, you know, the wiser person in the house, right? I think we all three yeah. share that in common. <laughs> and, um, and, then, um, and then I also got real present to my mom. Worked at, she worked at a seafood factory, packing seafood package. And she used to work, you know, and we all can relate to this. She, you know, our parent, my mom, she worked like eight in the morning to five o'clock at night, and she'd come home late at night, she cooked dinner for the whole family. And I can tell she'd be beat back in the days, right? And I was making money, you know, and one check, sometimes one check or two check can be as much as, you know, your mom's whole job for a whole year, you know what I mean? And so I started having more contribution mindset. And uh, as I got older, then my, one of my goals was to make a lot of money, and I wanted, the first thing I wanted to do was retire my mom. And so I made enough money and I told my mom, all right, you're done, all right? And then um, my second goal was to buy my dad a new car. I bought him a Toyota 4Runner, right? And then, um, and then I retired my dad and then I worked hard and I paid off their house, 
right? And then my dad, uh, I think when he was like in his uh, 60s, when he hit 60 years old, right, he always wanted a Mercedes Benz, so we bought him a Mercedes Benz, right? And then of course my family in Vietnam, I helped them, and then um, my mom and dad always wanted a nice place for my auntie and those guys, so we bought a house out there for my auntie and them. And then, um, you know, they always wanted to help churches, because my dad used to always go to the church in Vietnam. So when we went back to Vietnam a couple of years ago, we donated money and they made this, they remodeled this church. They made the church real beautiful and they put this big old plaque for my dad. Um, and then I think the biggest point where it really, really made me more responsible about money, right? And how powerful, you know, when we be responsible with money is when my dad passed away. Mm. When my dad, um, I get a phone call one day, my dad calls, hey, when you come over to the house and um, don't bring your wife Cammie. And so I get to the house and I walk up the stairs and my mom and dad sit on the sofa and they said, um, come here. And they were looking super sad. And I was like, what's going on? Why y'all are so sad? And so my mom and dad was like, well, we just got this letter. And then they showed me the letter and I read through the letter and it says cancer. And in that moment, man, my heart just dropped. Yeah. I had $6 million in the bank. And I said to my dad, we're going to fight this. We're going to take you wherever we need to go. We're going to actually cure this cancer for you. Yeah. Man, one year later, we had all different type of drug treatment. I was going to fly him to wherever he needed to go to, private jet, everything he needed to go to, to get there quick. I was going to trade all my money in to save my dad's life. And he died. Yeah. And in that moment, I realized money don't mean shit. Yeah. It's freedom, option, choice. Yeah. I couldn't do it in that moment. Yeah. I had $6 million I was going to trade my dad's life in. And he started over at zero. And to me, I realized money is good, but it's more for the, you know, what to do with it. Yeah. And that freedom, I have the choice, is why I work hard to have money. Yeah. And that's what I realized when I couldn't save my dad's life with $6 million. I realized money don't mean nothing to me no more. Yeah. I, I want to make a lot of money so I can actually make a difference to a lot of things. Yeah. That's why when I pass away, and Cammie passed away, we're gonna give Russell Hudson a little bit of the money, but the rest of the money is gonna go to good causes, good charity that are doing well, and we're gonna donate the money to good causes, and we don't want our kids to get it because we're gonna teach them how to make money till now when they get to, to the older, so they're gonna make a lot of money, and so they're gonna need my money. Yeah. But we wanna take our money, we wanna do what Bill Gates and Warren Buffett doing, we wanna do it in do for good causes. Yeah. And that's what money is for, for me. Yeah. So if I can't save my dad's life, What's the purpose of making money? That's why people don't get that. Yeah. They're working, they run their ass off on the treadmill all their life for what? For what purpose? Yeah. Who are you trying to prove? What are you trying to prove? Yeah. And that, my dad passing away was the best example of can't do nothing with all that money. Yeah. Man. It, it, it's it's I, I, I know it's, a, it's, a, it's heartbreaking to hear it, but it's such a powerful kind of moment as well. Real. Yeah. Yeah, man, I, I think that's actually something that uh, most people miss is that our life goes by very quick and we spend our time chasing something regardless if it's money or not that doesn't really mean anything at Nothing. the end of the day. Nothing. You know? Nothing. I think there's, there's nothing that fuels us more than the awareness of how uh, how short life really is. You know, my big breakthrough started right after I lost Jonas in May. I lost my dad in January. Yeah. And for a decade, I was just living paycheck to paycheck for a decade. Big paycheck to big paycheck. And Jonas passes away Memorial Day 2011. My dad passes away in January. I maybe have 1800 bucks to my name and three kids. And I think when we start living outside of ourselves and we start looking at 
who we want to be remembered by, that's when everything changes. Yeah, yeah, I think that's powerful. Uh, let me ask you, I guess this is for both of you guys. Uh, why is it important to be financially responsible and earn money knowing that it's not anything other than a tool? For me, is that you need some kind of financial to do certain things. Yeah. If you want to go on a vacation, you're going to need some money. You want to have a house, you're going to need some money. Right? I think you got to be f responsible. Mm. Don't let the money take you over, right? So you need, you need some kind of money. So that's why today, for me, I am like a beacon and I feel that God universe is using me as an example mm. that if I can do it, anybody can do it. Yeah. And so come from Vietnam with nothing and be able to be blessed and do what I do, have what I have. I want to use myself today as a lighthouse and be in the light out there and shine out there for people that need help out there. Mm. And my way of shining the light is I just going to do me. Yeah. I get up in the morning, I'll go cold call, I'll go door knock, I'll find me opportunity, I'll make it happen. And the more I do that, the more I'm lighting up the world, then people can go, man, that guy's walking the talk. I want to go hang out with him. And then teach them what I know about financial literacy. Mm. My inspiration today now is the new thing for me is, is creating generational wealth. Yeah. That's the new thing for me. Yeah. And today, that's why like for you and my two kids, you know what I mean? I want to show them how responsible I am with money, how I go make money, how I earn money, because they don't come that quick, fast money, yeah. right? And so I teach my kids how to do it. And my kids today are investing in real estate, doing their first flip right now, you know what I mean, at 15, 13. And so I want to teach them right now, because later on, right, they're going to be entrepreneurs. They're going to learn how to fish. So for me, if you're learning how to fish, the best way to teach your kid is to teach them how to fish themselves versus giving them the fish. Yeah. And to me, that is basically entrepreneurship. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I think the reason why it's, it's you know, we have to be financially responsible, it's like Warren Buffett said, if you don't find a way to make money in your sleep, you're going to work till you die. Right. And it's taken me so long. It's like, okay, when I start making a quarter million bucks a year, then I'll save. I can't save yet because it costs 150000 a year. Uh, when you have kids in Southern California, so when I make 250, that's when I'll invest. Make 250. Okay, you know what? When I make 350 a year, 350 is the the time where I'll be able to uh, I'll start investing. Yeah. You know that's not enough. So when I make 700 thousand, dude, this doesn't make doesn't make any sense. It sounds I, I feel dumb saying this, but I didn't buy my first house until I was making 700 thousand a year. What is my problem? And I didn't buy some crazy house. I bought an $800,000 home. Okay, so you know what? I'll start investing when I make a million dollars a year. Guess what I did when I made a million dollars a year? I bought a $2.2 million house. Okay, okay, okay. So here's the thing. When I start making $2 million, like how much do I have to make to be responsible? And I had to get to a point where last year, and this year, my income, it got to a point where I just feel stupid, to be honest. I'm like, it doesn't matter how much you make unless I get serious about putting some of this money aside. It's never going to happen. Yeah. And now, finally, Alana and I have this plan where we have a 10 home plan. There's a specific pocket that we're focused on where 10 homes which is not going to be that difficult. We believe we'll be able to do it in three years. The, the income from those 10 properties in our plan will give us the ability to stop working. Yeah. Now, the reality is I'm not going to stop working. I'm going to continue beasting out as real estate dude. Yeah. But this game plan of these 10 homes is going to give us the freedom, the option, and the choice to say no to this, to say yes to this. Yeah. No, you're clearly an asshole client. Yeah. Uh, I will refer this out. Yeah. You know, so it's taken a while. Like, I love when I meet a young go-getter who is saving 50% of their income because I spent 99.9% .9 of my income and saved half a point. Yeah. You know, but it was my journey. And everybody has their own journey. If I could do it back, if I could go through it again, I could have that.
I could stop working right now, but the reality is I can't, I can't stop working right now, yeah. you know, but we, it, it, now I'm, you know, I'll be 40 in two years and, um, we're finally at the point where we're like, all right, our journey took, uh, two decades longer than him to learn. But I'm, I'm, I'm honored and grateful to, to have taken the longer route. Yeah. And um, now, I, now we're trying to hustle and hurry it up and hurry it up and save, yeah. you know? Yeah, I think that's, that's so important. It's like, one, uh, when we make more, we spend more. I think that's a, Always, a, a human Always. behavior that we have a challenge Always. with, right? You find so, a way to spend it. That's why I tell people, if you don't park your money, you spend it. That's right. That's right. So w one, you know, that the famous quote, uh, learn to be responsible with little so you can be responsible with a lot, right? Starting now is building the discipline yeah. so that once you start making more money, it's just clockwork going right. into whatever you have set aside, right? right? So Mikey, what is, do you have like a, a, a measure, right? Of let's say you work at Starbucks mm -hmm. and you could barely save anything, right? Because you're barely making anything. Does that person still save? And if so, how much and how do you save money yeah. if you're barely making enough to survive? It's, it's such a good question. It's probably the most frequent asked question I get. And this is my belief on it. You have to save money always. You have to get used to the discipline. So let's just say right now it feels like you're spending everything that you make, yeah. right? Usually, it's because you have no purpose for your dollars. You make money and then the dollars go out and you go, where the heck did it go? Yeah. And like what we talked about earlier, you can make a million bucks and still have that feeling, right? Yes. So one, it's the importance of having a budget so that now you're saying this dollar goes there and that's the reason for it. There's something we talk about, uh, the concept paying yourself first, yeah. right? Automating your savings so that when your check comes in, whether it's 5%, 10%, 20%, it's automatically right. taken out. And that's taken out before you pay any bills, yeah. right? Now, there may be people who all of their spending goes towards necessities, right? Look, this is going for like where I live, where I eat, I have no leftover money, right? right? By doing the pay it yourself first model and creating the discipline, that is what's gonna force you to go, you know what, I gotta get a second job. Right. That's what's working three jobs. You know what, I gotta get three jobs. Yeah. And it's just saying, I'm gonna do this here is the discipline, and then as I make more money, all of this is already created. Right. So now I just maintain that same percentage or whatever it is, and it's just unfortunately, man, if we don't do that when we're not making a lot of money, right. it's so much harder to do it once we get money. Yeah. So that's what I say. It's, it, it, it's a, you gotta put yourself in a position to say, I'm gonna do this. Right. And even if it doesn't feel possible, it is possible. Yeah. Now, you got to live, you got to manage and live on what that check will be. Yeah. When I worked at the grocery store, they took out X amount of money for retirement. Right. You never miss anything. You're like, damn, my check's on $800 this week. I guess I have to figure out how to live off $800. That's right. right? Um, I can't. I'm going to have to go get me a second job. That's right. You know what I mean? I have to get a second job. I have to get a roommate. I have, you, you have to make sacrifice. And I think you know this better than anybody, right? You make sacrifice now yeah. so that you can have a better situation down the road. Right, because once you get down the road, you don't really have much options at that point, right? I'll tell you the biggest, hardest, and the biggest sacrifice owning rental is to have the mindset of putting money away. And I said this to someone yesterday, I think the biggest difference between someone who's flipping a lot of houses and someone that can actually put some money away is the one word, it's called delayed gratification. Yeah, 1,000%. That is the one thing that, you know, I know a lot of guys that flip houses, yeah. And they don't own no rental. Yeah. Right? This is why I always make funny video. I always, you know, basically just punk them. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Right? You're flipping 50 houses and you're bragging on Instagram and you're doing something. I always tell those that like, you're a dumbass. You know what I mean? You're not fucking smart. You're a dumbass. Right? But at the end of the day, 20 years later, they still got nothing. Yeah. They still on the treadmill running. They're old and shit. You know what I mean? Beers coming out of the chin. They still running on the treadmill. Yeah. Right? Because they don't understand that they call it delayed gratification. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. That's right. You know? That's yeah. right, 100%. And it, it, look, what we're all trying to get towards is having the choice to say, I don't want to work. Like Kevion, I think I'm going to work forever. I think we're called to work, right. but the choice is there, right. right? Guys, I appreciate both of you guys. I think there's so much wisdom. Everyone watching, uh, send this to anyone you know in real estate, anyone who flips homes that is struggling with moving over to 
creating a passive income stream that can ultimately achieve financial freedom. Send this out. So much wisdom here. Uh, thank you guys. We appreciate you all. Please leave comments and we'll see you guys on the next video.